Drag Race and Fifi O'Hara, Falcon exclusive Stephen Lee, aka Mascara, Car- uh, Kareem McJagger, and my guest co host, Nightlife Girl, Anthony John, and me, your favorite host with the sassy most. So raise a glass and let the drinks begin. <laughs> And most poor suckers are starving to death. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On the Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On the Rocks. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Lord have mercy, it's going to be a bumpy night. We are celebrating drag of all kinds tonight. Uh, Buttons and bows and pantyhose on the Rocks podcast, the place where we're too glam to give a damn. Uh, Halle Berry posted that she finally has abs that she's been working on during quarantine at age 53. I am so motivated to wait until I'm 53 to try to get abs. (laughs) Uh, Quarantine cop queen here. Uh, That's all I got to say. Okay, today's show is brought to you uh, by Drag4.fans, founded by the creators of the award-winning Just For Fans site. Drag for Fans is a free-to-join platform for drag performers of all levels and influence. Watch, subscribe, and tip your drag content creators around the world. All you drag queens need a little income right now, so Shantae, they pay. Uh, the show is presented by Straw Hut Media. You can watch and or listen to our every one of our now over 200 episodes at ontherocksradioshow.com. Hello to our listeners around the nation on every major podcast platform, including iHeartRadio and Pandora. We are on Gay Binge TV and on the Facebook uh, pages of Now Trending App, GED Magazine, and I Love Gail LGBT, and of course, On The Rocks Radio Show on Facebook. We are also streaming on Roku and Amazon Fire TV at outat.tv um, and heretv.com and on YouTube's Planet Out channel. We're everywhere. And then subscribe to us on your favorite platform. Like us on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air. Send me an email. Book me for a wedding, funeral, quinceanera, bris. I don't care. I will be there. Well, I will zoom in, okay? Uh, send us an email at info at ontherocksradioshow.com. Send us your question, comments, and nudes. Boop, boop. Uh, Kurt, do you have a pun for us today? Of course I do. Okay. Lay it on me, Kurt. Uh, did you know I have some uh, some broken puppets for sale? Uh... No, no, no strings attached. That is awful. So sorry to our listeners and our viewers. <laughs> uh, check out the new issue of Metrosource magazine. Uh, I am the lead writer for Metrosource, which is the national LGBT magazine. Uh, this month, we interviewed RuPaul's Drag Races, Michelle Visage, Bob the Drag Queen, and YouTuber Kaylin Allen from The Ellen Show. Mmm, The Ellen Show. And it's on newsstands or metrosource.com. All right. Uh, is our guest co-host here, Kurt? Uh, we just had someone pop in I, as iPad 2, so I'm assuming that's them. I'm going to let him in right now. There he is. Okay, let me introduce him. Uh, my guest host, here to keep me on track, Anthony John is a man of many hats because he barely wears pants. He has worked on production for some of the most well-known gay adult studios on Earth, and for over a decade has worked in almost every level of production of major events in gay nightlife, coast to coast and internationally. Oh. Uh, about a year ago, he accepted the position of director of events for just for dot fans and more recently took up the reins as the business director for drag for dot fans. Um, and he and I co-host, by the way, the Drag Race Hang over podcast available on your favorite podcast platforms and youtube where we give you a tipsy recap of everything drag race please welcome my guest co-host for today anthony john well hello hello um is that a new picture behind you or are you still in in florida i'm still in florida i got i i came here surprised my boyfriend with two days in disney world during a pandemic and of course the airline canceled my flight back so what do we do we go to the other two parks and Anthony slowly goes broke. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> but hey, it's Disney. I, I, the longest wait time has been 10 minutes. So. I'm well, that's because everybody's dead. Everybody's dying out there. <laughs> Peter Pandemic, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're good. Wah, wah. Okay. When we first started, when you and I first started talking about canceled nightlife and drag life, um, it was months ago when we were like, oh my God, it might actually last like three months. Now yeah. we're looking at cancellations until 2021. Um, yeah. How do you think this is going to affect night's life and drag life once this is all over? You know, I really, I, I don't know. I've given up guessing. 
to be honest. I mean, I, I really didn't think this was going to last longer than than a few months, um, which was great for the drag for fans platform and and yeah. you know no better time than a pandemic where you're stuck in the house or any situation where you can't perform live for people you could do it online um and and still reach your fan base and grow a fan base but now we're on like six months like six months girl and i'm like but you know what still it's just i i don't know i don't know the long-term effects i don't know what it's gonna do i'm done guessing well, and, I mean, nightlife is literally your life, and you have events or had events weekly, monthly, all around the globe. And now it's like, um, yeah. meh, meh. no. But what is your what is your take on like this digital drag revolution? And I know drag for fans has a big part of its success. But what do you think it's going to do to drag audiences once it's all over? Like, are we going to get lazy? Are we going to tip less? I mean, people are getting free shows everywhere on social media without leaving their home. Well, yeah, but, at the, um, you know, you still got that, that you have free shows all the time. You know, um, <clears throat> you go to Mickey's or you go to, you know, in L.A. or you go to um, one of the bars in, in New York where I live. or, or there, You're always getting the free shows, you know. Um, <clears throat> it was hard to charge for drag shows mostly. But, um, you know, again, I think it is the whole the whole dynamic has changed. So it's it's really weird. Now you have to sit at home and, and drink alone and virtually tip. Whereas, you know, you would do it live and it was just the, the, the feeling, the vibe was so much different. I think we discussed that about the whole RuPaul thing, how the whole, the whole, you know, uh, going out to a bar and, and being with a whole crowd of people watching Drag Race was, it was so much different than being at home and trying to keep that energy alive and trying to, to do it. So, um, I don't know, I think the best people to ask that question to are the drag queens, you know, um, you know, how, well, how, how they're doing it. Well, and what I've heard, and we have a lot of mutual friends in, in the drag world, what I've heard is that when uh, digital shows were first happening, everybody, like you said, was at home drinking, they were getting a stimulus check, they were getting their, their bonus, and they were, yeah. you know, tipping five, ten bucks, and drag queens were, were making a few hundred bucks. But yeah. now that things are, are pretty dire financially with no sign of coming out, <coughs> tips, tips have been cut. And so sure. a lot of our friends are like, uh, oh, crap, <coughs> got, but there's, I'm no, coughing you're, you're just and so, I have to say, so emotional. Look at, look at me. This is me. This is me at almost 40 years old. Now I'm doing shots of Pepto-Bismol before our show. Oh my God, girl. Get your oh. life together. You are, you, girl. you're, you're, it was the you're food just and a wine festival at Epcot today. <laughs> <laughs> I've been drinking since nine o'clock. <clears throat> but that's n normal for you. <laughs> I know, but not in all so the parts changed. of the world at Epcot. Um, but I have a really bad scratch right now. <clears throat> so, yeah, um, you're right. When it first started and everyone got the stimulus check and people were tipping, people were feeling like, got to get the girls through it, got to get our nightlife through it, let's be supportive of everyone. And we saw all those virtual parties popping up and all this stuff. And it's, it's just, I think people have, um, unfortunately, just grown, grown so used to this now that, that I think... You know, and everyone is kind of hurting a little bit more, you know, and, and then the uncertainty with the unemployment checks and uncertainty with jobs yeah. and uncertainty. You know, I live in Manhattan, blocks away from the theater district, and it's I, the entire, your entire way of life is gone. I mean, the restaurants that were supported by it, you know, the, the clothing stores, the, the tourism, everything just crumbles. You know, as the gays in Manhattan, we were just going to complain about the gyms, but it's a bigger <laughs> picture, you know, it's. It's a much bigger picture, and there's a lot of people hurting now. So it's it's difficult to to dig in your pocket when your pocket's empty, you know. Yeah. So you know, what can you do? Um, but there are there are ways to go around it. There there is there are these platforms that drag for fans and such has where you do have the loyal base that they will pay a, a small fee a month to 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 not to support you but be entertained by you. It's we shouldn't see it as charity it's not charity they're 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 working for their money so um there it's it, there are very creative ways of doing it and go live streaming and you know selling merchandise and whatever it may be you know um you know putting on face in the in the shower i don't know keep it creative you know <laughs> but like <laughs> but like do something to to earn the dollars but it is it is difficult it's 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 scary to be nah. honest man nah. oh. downer all right. 
<laughs> downer. <laughs> uh, well, you are going to help me keep, uh, you're going to help keep me on track if you can survive here. Uh, but let's welcome our first guest, uh, Jeremy Carey, aka Fifi O'Hara. Riddle me this, riddle me that. Watch out, girls, this bitch is back. Jeremy Ooh. Carey is an American drag performer, cosplay artist, actor, and singer who came to international attention as a runner up on the fourth season of RuPaul's Drag Race. His cosplay and drag social media series covering 365 days of drag and 31 days of Harry Potter inspired wizardry have gone viral. And just this week, he released his image of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, which is a start of a new series to draw attention to his current campaign, Drag Out the Vote, inspired by his massive Hurricane Maria benefit. And it includes the use of drag to engage voters of all struts of life to sashay their way to the polls, girl. Uh, Jeremy has appeared in a number of music videos with other Drag Race alum, as well as a solo artist. He has appeared on Skin Wars, Andy Cohen's Watch What Happens Live, and is the most adorable person on Twitch. Please welcome Jeremy Carey. Ooh. Hi, girl. Hi. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing good. Okay. Anthony, look at this setup here. This setup is like the best Zoom setup I have ever seen in my <laughs> life. You got Gizmo. His hair matches, like, you know, the curtains match the drapes. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't taken it that, that far is a yet. Set Maybe. Up. <laughs> that is a set up. That's for your Just for Fans. That's the Just yeah, yeah, for Fans, yeah. just for yeah, fans yeah, yeah. crossover. So, um, Jeremy, I have to know, you know, you have so much personality and so much art to you, but I have to know, what kind of kid were you growing up? Um, and what was it like growing up in Texas, of all places? Um, I've I've always been artsy. Um, I've loud class clown. I've always been like um, wanting to make things and 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 I used to draw all the time. I wanted to be a cartoonist when I was a kid. So I used to um, I, I I used to think that like to be a cartoonist for Disney, you like they worked at Disney World. So I would like actually draw scenes from like Disney movies and then like mail them to Disney World, thinking I was gonna get a job. It was just, like, Aww, that's funny. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's um, cute though. It was fun. Yeah, and I played lots of sports. I I, um, I played baseball for most of it, and and I loved it. It was fun. Oh, mm, mm. I would love to see you in a baseball uniform. <laughs> <laughs> just, now, for know, fans, I, just for fans. Just for fans. Now you know uh, Tim Burton did work for Disney uh, as an illustrator, and yeah. they rejected every single character development that he did because he was like they were like this is too weird and now some of his sketches of Alice in Wonderland some of his sketches of characters that we know that were done by somebody else are in his like exhibit and it's so funny yeah. to see how Disney is like oh yeah Tim Burton we love Tim Burton well, and yeah. Tim Burton, like no Tim Burton is one of my favorites even my my so like this entire sleeve that I'm building is a Tim Burton sleeve and like oh, I just yeah. got James and the Giant Peach that was the whole reason I moved to New York is James and Giant Peach movie so I just got this one right before quarantine <laughs> so <laughs> yeah I love it yeah um now what advice uh, do you have for an LGBTQ youth who has kind of been disowned or shut out by their their family. I got this question um, because you you have shared your coming out story and it, it, it didn't go so well. You kind of ended up uh, homeless without your family. What, what advice yeah. would you give for somebody going through that, uh, especially right now? Um, so uh, yeah, I, I very open about it. I was homeless. I, I used to sleep out of my car. Um, I would hook up with men, just have a couch to sleep on at night. I would I would steal food. Like so, I've I've been there and it's struggling. And it's as is a real issue with LGBT youth. And um, the best thing that could have happened to me though was um, surrounding, like finding my circle of friends that um, that supported who I authentically was. And not, and they weren't trying to make me somebody else. And that, and that was the best thing. It was a safe environment for me to to uh, be in. And I know that's hard to find, but with social media yeah. now, it's so much. I feel old saying this, but it's so it's it's so much easier for people to connect now and and find that circle of friends and that new support system and your new family. So um, just whenever they do come up, just make sure it's in a safe place. No, where where did you gather your your personal strength? to kind of overcome the couch surfing and still continue on your journey. You just didn't get, you know, like a job at McDonald's and that was your life. You continued on this journey. Being an artist is difficult, whether you have family support or not. It's just a difficult yeah. industry. Yeah, um, I've, I've always been a fighter and um, I don't, I don't like losing, as we saw on TV. No, um, I don't. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm always, no, I was just like, you got to, you got to survive, and I wasn't going to give up, and and I had to do what I had to do to survive. And um, so when I was younger, I used to read um, 
um, comic books and that was my escape like to like whether I was being abused by my dad or or homeless or anything I would read comic books to like put myself in their position to become that superhero and just get lost in that moment for that one second and one of my favorites was Phoenix which is what my original drag name was and it was yeah. because like Right. She she went through so much shit, but she always rose from the ashes, and I related to that so much. And I I it's cheesy as it sounds. I was putting myself in Phoenix's shoes, and I was like, I can get through this. I could do this. Like I know there's a strong me in there. I can do this. Now, what was your entree into uh, the whole drag world? Like, what, what what was your very first on stage performance? Um, <laughs> oh, uh, tell me, girl. There's a story there. Um, tell me. Well, so my, my so my mom actually actually introduced me to drag queens, and I, my very first drag queen I ever met was this like seven foot four tall queen named Beyonce in San Antonio, and um, <laughs> just super nice, super sweet. But I, I honestly, drag scared me though. I didn't I didn't get it. I didn't understand why they wanted to dress up that way. I didn't understand the art. And it wasn't until that it was that, you know, that group of people, all the drag queens, all the artists that brought me under their wing to take care of me that I kind of like, it opened my eyes to see like who these people were and the art and I fell in love with it then. But um, I remember going to a show with Beyonce and um, <laughs> uh, we're watching the show and it was just like, people were going through the motions, you know, like they didn't have any feeling when they were performing. And as a, as a, always a performing kid, I was like, oh, I could do that. That's, I could do that way better. And the people next to me were like, okay, yeah, we'll do it. And so they're like, I dare you. And I was like, all right, cool. So I remember I went to like Charlotte Ruth and like Forever 21. I bought like <laughs> oh the zipper. Oh my God, that's name of the best. <laughs> I, yeah, oh I bought like God, a zipper um, a, a mini skirt and like, it was like this like fake corset. And I did, I did Missy Elliott's I'm really, really hot <laughs> into uh, Britney Spears' <laughs> Breathe on Me and on an oh, amateur oh. night. Yeah, and I won. I didn't tell anybody. I paid someone to do my makeup. I didn't tell anybody it was me, which I don't know how they didn't know it was me because I had a snaggle tooth at the time. And <laughs> where is this brand new queen with a snaggle tooth performing? <laughs> yeah, from. But I won. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. get that crowd. Um, okay, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about your drag race experience. Um, being an artist, uh, being a uh, being Fifi, playing Fifi is just one of the many facets you have as a performer. Was it weird entering a competition with you playing a character when so many of the drag queens live and breathe and basically are are just that character was that a weird kind of competition environment to be part of um not so i never did i and a lot of people do do drag to find like a voice or they it helps them feel more comfortable in their own skin and i totally understand that and i get that but for me it was never that again it started off as a dare and then i've always been a performer so i love creating and then and then entertaining people so for me it was a totally different thing it was always jeremy and then here's this this like um, creation I created. Um, so going on on Drag Race, it was fun because like, I, I like playing, um, well, season four, I like playing the villain. I thought it was fun. I did a damn good job at it. It made some great TV. <laughs> so, but it was, I, I remember like the story producers would joke, like I, I I was hired as like an unofficial story producer because I'd be like, okay guys, like what if what if I do this and go over to so-and-so and do that? And they'd be like, oh, work bitch, like go ahead. And so we would do all this, <laughs> and that was, that was just fun to me. Now, now watching it later, people and people thinking like that's real TV and going crazy, that was not fun. <laughs> And so as I started doing uh, Dragons Down being on TV, I, um, I fell in love with it even more because of the connection I made with, with fans around the world. And like, I, I, like, it made me really love this art and, and, and fall in love with these characters that I create, whether they're like my Harry Potter stuff or, or you know, cosplay or whatever, or, or I'm performing Beyonce. Um, but um, going on to All Stars 2 is a totally different um, experience because my my art was so meant so much to me because I've put so much into it now and especially because I, I put so much in my art so my fans would enjoy it and for people to rip it apart it was just like not gonna happen not for me <laughs> like I I I I didn't like um someone wanting me to be to fit a mold for somebody else's idea of what art should be now, now what kind of kickback have you received from the drag community itself, from wanting to make a different, uh, like a different, uh, differentiation between Jeremy and and Fifi, um, are some drag queens like, who do you think you are? <laughs> no, none of the drag queens have. Um, it's the fans, the the fans of the show, um, not my fans, because my fans are like 100. But fans of the show are like, um, you know, 
the show um, made Fifi and blah, 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 blah. And like, um, uh, you are Fifi. And that's the problem with the show <laughs> is that the fans think they own us and you don't. And so <laughs> um, I, I created Fifi. You don't see, um, you know, uh, Tyler Perry going around and everybody calling him Medea. They don't do that. And so, um, only at the gay clubs, <laughs> what? <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, but it was more of like um, a, a thing of respect. And and I wrote this. I, I wrote this thing the other day about realizing that I put too much power into the word Fifi because behind that, the entire time, behind Fifi and all my art was Jeremy the entire time. And and Jeremy wasn't getting any of the credit for it. And I was like, you know what? Why am I giving someone else all the credit for my hard work? And so oh. um, I was done with it. So, oh. yeah. That is a good way of looking at things. Yeah. Now, um, Anthony, now I know that you've worked with a number of the, the RuPaul drag queens. You've worked with them closely be before they were on the show, and then you've seen them after the show. Um, as, as I have shared the stage with some of these performers, I'm and there so is sorry. such. Where are you going here? <laughs> well, no, and I, I want us to have a really uh, honest conversation about this. Sometimes, and, and uh, Jeremy, like you said, sometimes it's like people just are all that character now, and that's all that they kind of have. They don't have the whole performance aspect of it, other projects. And Anthony, I know you and I have seen somebody totally, their personality has changed. It's like, do you remember us getting drunk backstage before? Yeah. And now you're you're too good to take a picture with your fans. And do you remember who you really are? Like, Anthony, yeah. I know that you've seen that kind of change, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've seen it in, I've seen it in the, the drag world. I've seen it more in the porn world than the drag world. Um, but, um, you know, actually most of the people in the drag world that I've that I knew, quote, knew before and knew after. Most of them stay about the same, you know, off stage. I, this, most of them. Some of them don't. I mean, I can name names. I don't care. But Silky um, Kanash. Oh, I just sneezed. Sorry. No, I was going to say India, but, um, <laughs> but who? people will still say who. Who? <laughs> Let me Google that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm um, like, um, but no, I, you know, it, it, it comes with the, it comes with the territory sometimes. I, I always kind of laughed at it. I never took any of it serious. I, I can take it. I just, I would hate them to act a certain way to people who don't know them, you know, who, who, who don't realize the character over the real person. And, and sometimes, you know, like, like Jeremy mentioned, like the fans can sometimes, I think in their eyes, feel as though they're, they're deserving of something. Um, and some of those fans are, are, the doors shut really fast by the way that they're treated sometimes yep. um, just in passing or, you know, it's because I, I guess, and I, it's a reason why I would, I would hate to be on the performer side of things simply for the fact that um, you can't get a break. Like, like I see some of these, like they're just out shopping or something and a fan will come up and they're like, girl, like go away or something. And now you're a bitch or now you're evil or now you're, it's like, you know, I'm just, trying to get some produce you know? <laughs> let me buy this cucumber and privacy please yeah, God damn it. I just want to buy a deal to a chi cheese um, <laughs> but, now, Jeremy, but yeah it, it comes with the territory i think jeremy do you think you'll ever go back to the workroom fuck no <laughs> no that's a, that's a All big right. fuck no yeah no okay no. <laughs> All right. um but what did you learn uh most professionally and personally from doing your first season of a drag race? I, you know, I always had a thick skin. So, um, but now like, I just, I just don't give a damn what people think. Like, I know I'm a good person. I know I'm a great person. <laughs> um, and um, the only people that deserve to be in my circle are um, the people that are going to uplift, um, like not only me, but the other people in my circle, because I want us to ha all be happy, but um, people that just support me for who I am and not trying to make me somebody that I'm not, so. Um, exactly. Now, part of your art is is immersed in, in cosplay. Cosplay is just a whole different beast. The artists are different. The fans are different. Uh, the medium which you present it is totally different. What character first attracted you to cosplay um, and in the cosplay world, are there the same kind of social media haters, politics, and jealousies that exist in the drag world? 
I think cosplay and, and drag is very similar. I mean, uh, drag, you, you're cosplaying a character. You're cosplaying whether it's your fiance or Gaga on stage or something. Um, um, it's still all cosplay. You know, it's just costume and you're playing a character. So I don't feel like it's very different. There is definitely the same drama. There's definitely um, a lot of hate and everything in there. And there's, there's definitely a huge... Um, a, a, a disrespect for uh, cosplayers of color and um, they're often ignored. Yeah, especially since um, like when you see in the cosplay world, they normally go for like the skinny, pretty little white or the little Asian girl that looks just like, you know, the, the cute little kawaii character. And then they'll, they'll ignore like a black cosplay artist who's just as beautiful doing the exact same thing. So that is a very real issue in the cosplay world. And, I, and I've spoken out about that quite often and, uh, and I hope to change that. Uh, what was the first character that inspired you to get into cosplay? You know, I, I grew up on like um, Power Rangers. And um, <laughs> so I had a weird thing because I, I dated girls. Um, and so I had a weird thing. Like I, I was really attracted to the pink ranger, but I really wanted, you know, to be with the green ranger. So I wanted to be both <laughs> of them. So I remember those were my, like, my first two um, cosplays I really wanted to do. And then I was none of them. And then I just ended up cosplaying Rita Repulsa. So I just took it the villain start from the very beginning. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, po probably Power Rangers is what inspired me. Yeah. They're so campy and over the top costumes. Absolutely. All right, so let's let's talk about dragon cosplay. It is expensive, girl. <laughs> Do you have any tips for people wanting to get into either that are on a budget? Don't. No, I'm just kidding. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> make your own stuff. <laughs> no, yeah, I yeah, I agree. I make my own things, and I think the problem um, is, especially in the drag race world it's so it's so much now like here's a beautiful picture of me and this is what everybody else did for me that i did not do and you know that's cool and rue did say she's looking for the next her and that's it's it, you know wow. so um but i think if you're going to cosplay the coolest part of cosplaying is creating um these characters by hand and um you and learning new skills and and that you can a learn a new um talent or trait or skill um but then you get to teach other people i think that's really cool but yeah make stuff play with things F figure it out all right um i want to take a look at the psa for um drag out the vote uh which is the campaign uh that, that you're currently working on um and it's so needed right now uh kurt let's play that psa for drag out the vote a hundred million people did not vote in 2016 one out of five queer people in the United States of America are not registered to vote. But drag out the vote. We are going to get people across America to register to vote and get involved in one of the most important elections of this lifetime. This is the moment that we need to do a huge transformation and change. We have drag queens leading the movement for the AIDS crisis, for marriage equality, and now to protect our trans brothers and sisters as their rights are being rolled back. You need to make your voice heard. If you don't have your voice heard within this country, you aren't doing your job. It is important to vote because not just you, but think of the, the people around you. So many people have so much at stake with this election. Being an immigrant is not easy, it's hard, and it's, it's so important for you guys to go out and vote. This is Cynthia Lefontaine. Fifi O'Hara. Prita Filter. I'm Mariko Cummings. Mona Exchange. Mercedes Iman Diamond. Drag out the vote. Thank you. Uh, one out of five members of our LGBTQ community are not registered to vote. Um, why do you guys think that that is? That surprised me, by the way, when I found that out. I'll go. Um, um, oh. the, <laughs> um, oh. First off, I would say that was my first time seeing that, that video. I heard about it, but I've never seen it till now. So, and it kind of like got like emotional seeing that. I, those, I love those girls so much. And um, yeah. that event, um, it was in Minneapolis. Um, and it was the first time that me and Jackie Huba, who created Drag Out the Vote, um, got together to, to raise all this money. And um, I get so, I get emotional thinking about it because it means so much to me that there are, I, I, I joke and I, and I talk a lot of shit about Drag Race and the Queens, but I, there are so many good people that have come from that show. And that those girls that night um, flew out, donated their time and money to raise um, because they truly care. And they're, they're not just somebody that's like talking um, 
to look good on social media like they care and they want to be there and I and I can't thank those queens enough for being a part of this so first I do want to say that so thank you for doing that um but I think a reason why um one in five are not um registered and, and I I've said this on um like other interviews and with Jackie is that a education is very important um I don't think people know where to go whether it's how to register um um what dates they can do stuff and when the deadline is. And um, on Drag Out the Votes, um, Drag Out the Vote uh, 2020.org, their website, they have all that information available for you. But I think accurate education is something that we need to have. Um, and social media now, it's so easy to just look at something and, be, and get mad at it or you know fall in love with it, or but without even knowing the yep. research. And yeah, just, or just share, YouTube. share, share. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think what's really, really cool is um, that Drag Out the Vote is making sure to spread accurate information, and that is the information we should be sharing. So that way we can, you know, get people inspired and um, with um, facts on how they can create change. Anthony, why do you why do you think so many people are are not registered? Um, well, I mean, I don't know what the average is in terms of the population as a whole, but it sounds kind of along the same lines. I think probably about one in five Americans aren't registered to vote. So I think it's, you know, uh, we may just be falling into that same pattern, but maybe just, you know, disenfranchisement, uh, you know, they just don't feel as though they're important enough or their vote really matters or they're, you know, they, they vote blue in a red state or red in a blue state and they feel it's useless i don't know maybe they're a third party who's been told that you can't vote for a third party because it's throwing away a vote so they don't register um it, maybe they're not excited about the candidates you know i don't know there's there's probably a million reasons why but ultimately i just think as america as a whole we just we don't register enough people and we don't and, and then when the election actually comes it's not enough people vote you know that's it's We've, we've taken it for granted quite a bit, um, but I, I don't have an answer. I know I'm registered, I know I vote, you know, <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on that field, but you know, not, it's, this isn't porn, you know, to ask me a porn <laughs> question. Okay. I, 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 <laughs> There's a I campaign also, for that too. <laughs> I, also, I also think, I also no, think no, that no, like, no. sorry, go ahead. No, uh, I, I, this, that's it. That's my opinion. I just think we're kind of like it's one in five Americans probably aren't registered to vote. You know, I well, don't know. And I also think, um, it's like growing up, like with my background, I, that wasn't even on my mind. I didn't think of that. I was thinking, like, how am I going to survive today? How where, where am I going to sleep? Yeah. So I, and and so I think um, through having like you know um, these the stars from like Drag Race, you know, like Britta Filter has, has been freaking amazing, by the way. Um, she's a national coach for Drag Out the Vote. Uh, getting her on there and making these videos like daily on her um, social media or getting all these like younger generation inspired. And um, uh, like more than ever, this election is a time that you should care because it is a matter of surviving now with who we have in office. And um, I, I think that's, I, I, I think we just got to show people that um, their voice is very important. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, so sorry to report, ladies and gentlemen, and in betweeners, uh, Jeremy is married. Uh, he is taken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how did how did you guys meet? Oh. <laughs> Bye. Uh, <laughs> we we can arrange something. Um, so uh, we. We, I wish it was a cooler story. We met at a, well, it is kind of a cool story. We did, we met at a bar. It was during the um, premiere of season four of Drag Race. And um, I remember he tipped me during my number and I was just like, oh, who's, who is this cute guy? And um, I, I was like, I don't want to meet you in drag. I want to meet you yeah. as, like <laughs> boy. And um, Morgan was, Morgan McMichaels. Um, she oh, was right. like, who, um, like if you could have any guy in this club who would it be and i was like well i'm not doing that and she was like no come on just pick somebody just for fun she's like you're a drag race girl now <laughs> i was like well <laughs> i was like um i think that guy over there is cute and um she ended up him um, my husband and her ended up being best friends i didn't know this and she introduced us oh and, wow um, yeah so thank you morgan That's awesome <laughs> yeah she's great yeah, she is. Now, 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 I know that you're having to spend a lot of time with your boo because you're not able to go out on tour. Um, do you have any couple survival tips during quarantine? 
Um, sleep in separate rooms. No, I'm just kidding. No, uh, we, <laughs> um, we do often though, but not because like we have problems. Does not hear that. But. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. No, but we. Uh, I do sleep in separate rooms often because um, he's. I was saying this earlier that he's he a snores. farter. No, he, oh no, no. He, but he he's does snore. Because he farts in his sleep. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he's just talking to me. No. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> man, <laughs> <laughs> nobody snores so loud so I, sometimes i do sleep in the other room but i i think it's great because on tour like I, we missed each other you know because i never i never yeah. get to see him and um now that we get to see each other a lot um it's made us like connect in a different way now which i think is really really cool and i was saying before like our arguments happen in relationships and they should and that's just part of that's just part of relationship. I think people often think like, oh, we had a fight. We this isn't gonna work. No, fights are good. Like you need to have a fight, and um, not, not all fights, but like uh, like little fights, which is what yeah. they normally are, um, are good to have because you, you guys learn about each other, and then you grow from this. And then you have makeup sex. So absolutely, everybody, <laughs> everybody wins. All right, Jeremy, are you ready to play a little uh, on the rocks rapid fire? Let's do it. Okay. Uh, a celebrity you would love to give a cosplay makeover? <sighs> celebrity I would love to. Um, uh, since she's never done her makeup before, I'm going to say RuPaul. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, you said celebrity. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. But then, but then Raven would be out of a job. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, that was a that was a triple whammy. That was good. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> <What's happening here? laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Jeremy. <laughs> Jeremy, if you were to do a drag race boxing match, what queen would Fifi be fighting to beat the crap we, out of? We Ooh. kind of did that though in season four. We did the wrestling challenge. Um, if a boxing that I'd like to beat the just for fun, or sure. real. <laughs> no, um, just for fun, who would I like to beat the crap out of? You know, let's just throw RuPaul right back up in that ring. <laughs> wow, she's it. popular tonight. Let's, let's just do it. <laughs> nah, the kids would love it. I'm giving the I'm giving the children. Um, I'm they're, keep, they're yeah. being fed tonight. <laughs> well, hey, and we know that uh, RuPaul has that boxing match mask, right? <laughs> she does have her little luchador la latex mask. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> He's a wrestler. He did. <laughs> All right, uh, Fifi. Uh, Fifi has had a few names. Um, what name would you give Fifi now if you had to adopt a whole new drag name? Oh, you got Ooh. a question. Jeez. That's like, that's hard. Cause like, like uh, that's hard. Maybe I'd go back to just Phoenix. Cause I was Phoenix before Ooh. the show and I changed it for, right. for the show. So I would, I'm going to go back to my roots. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, uh, strangest thing you've purchased online during quarantine. <laughs> uh, and did it fit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, I have He's ordered a bunch. Right I have, <laughs> or not, because it didn't fit. Um, <laughs> so, um, no, I have. I, I uh, strange is I don't have bought anything. Oh, you know what? We did buy all this new kitchen stuff, but that's not strange. I mean, it's strange because I don't cook really often in the house. We like order everything in New York, but like, yeah. I guess that would be the strangest. But I'm like on. So anybody go on AliExpress because I'm like on there like 24 seven. Like I get bored in the shower and I'll sit in the shower for like two hours just buying yeah. like. <laughs> that I don't need for a dollar. <laughs> you get it five months later in the mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It shows like up. Yeah. Doesn't do it. <laughs> All right, f f final rapid fire question. I think you kind of answered this. If you were to create a challenge on Drag Race that RuPaul would have to do, what would that challenge be? <laughs> a and smoky she, eye, a smoky she, virgin <laughs> eye. And, uh, and point to the foundation on the table. There we go. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> She went no oh shit. my god! We're gonna get we're gonna get <laughs> sued for this one. Michelle Visage is gonna take like a man. Oh, <laughs> didn't she back in the day? Back in the old yeah, like the nineties. So yeah, didn't she do her own makeup back in the nineties? She just kind of looked like a dude, though. I mean, anybody can do their makeup, but did they do it well? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. All right, Jeremy. Uh, <laughs> tell our audience where you want them to find you and follow you. My grinder, my OnlyFans, my no, I'm just kidding. No, my I, I don't know. I'm not yet, but soon. Um, no, the um, I'm on Instagram at Fifi O'Hara. That I haven't been able to change that yet. But I'm um, on Twitter at um, Just Jeremy. It's J U S T Jeremy. So um, they can find me there. 
also yeah. and also uh, be a part of drag out the vote uh follow jeremy on instagram and reshare share 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 away um and go look at his ruth gator bins RPG. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> There we go. It's so wonderful. Thank, thank you. you so much, Jeremy. Uh, I cannot you. wait to see what the future holds for you. And thank you for helping get the word out to drag out the vote. Not a problem. Thank you for having me so much. Make sure to of fucking course. vote. <laughs> Bye. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we have Falcon exclusive Stephen Lee. When we come back. And we're back. <laughs> Uh, I want to introduce uh, Stephen Lee, Falcon Studio exclusive. Stephen Lee is a gay man's fantasy. He's Georgia born. He's a high school jock. He's a smart guy. He holds a bachelor's degree in atmospheric science. And for a brief time, he showed off his assets on television working as a TV meteorologist in Texas. Can you imagine waking up to that every morning? Yes. (laughs) It is hot tonight. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the weather was never sexier. <laughs> um, he's also not afraid to play with his feminine side and took part took part in Falcon Studios' Miss Pineapple pageant as his alter ego, Kata Mascara. Um, and he is quickly becoming a drag queen to contend with. Please welcome Stephen Lee. <laughs> Mascara. Hey, girl, hey. How, How are you? Doing? Good. Good. Good to see you. Ooh. She's okay. all dressed up. Finish him. Got face on. <laughs> Karis in the house. <laughs> what, what I think is so fun is on your social media, you actually share the process. Um, you know, because you're you're uh, you're not brand new, but you're relatively new to the drag world. So you're you're still learning tips. You're still trying things out, and I love seeing that process because we know the Stephen Lee that we that you know that that we recognize from our from our extracurricular activities um, and then to see a blossom into uh, Cata Mascara. I just love saying that word, by the way. <laughs> now you really enjoy playing with the feminine versus masculine part of your persona um, as a top in your scenes in the gay uh, adult film world, but also as a drag, uh, as a drag queen on the streets and social media. Um, tell me about the whole idea of growing up masculine in Georgia as a high school jock um, and how did that kind of play with your sexuality and who you are today? Yeah, um, so I actually, I was born in Georgia, but I grew up in Ohio, but I mean, it's still, you know, rural. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was, I I mean, I didn't even know I was gay until, I mean, I guess I kind of knew, but I, I was in denial until like senior year and I didn't come out till freshman year of college. But I mean, there was nobody else that was gay in the town that I grew up in. I graduated with 68 people. Um, and it was public school, so it was really tiny. Um, so I guess I didn't really have experiences until I went to college, and then I didn't really like live anywhere that was a big city until I was 25, and that was El Paso, which still isn't even that big. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, that must have been very interesting, and you know, uh, I, I was a, a late in coming out as well. I was a sophomore in college, and you have this idea that you're totally out of the loop. And then when you have like your first kind of sexual partner, you're afraid to have that conversation. You don't want to appear that you don't know what you're doing, but you need to have that conversation because you need to be comfortable. You need to enjoy it. Um, and there's stuff that you should talk about being, uh, you know, a gay man, but coming out late kind of kind of puts a, a, a stop to that. Now, what was your coming out story? Um, so my best friend actually was freshman year, first semester. My best friend in college, which I mean, we'd only been best friends for like three months. But she looked at me and she was like, are you gay? And I was like, taken off, caught off guard. And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, well, I'm a college buddy. And then she told everybody. So it was real easy for me to come out because she told everybody for me. Oh, oh. lovely. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, what, that's what best friends do. <laughs> it's like, keep a secret. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, how did your family react? Um, so actually, at that time, I had stopped talking to them. I... Um, I left home completely at 19, but I was 18 then and I had already stopped talking to them. Um, So I never officially came out to them, Um, but I'm from a small town in Ohio. So like when I came out and I came out on social media, of course they all talked and so they knew. Yeah. Um, But I never came out and I never felt the need to come out to them because they're not a part of my life anymore. Um, We're on better terms now, but um, I, for a long time, I was really angry at them. I did not speak with them. Um, now we're made up, but I still don't feel, I don't feel like I have any reason to include them in anything that I do. Um, so I never felt the need to 
come out to them because it's not, they're not important enough for it to matter. So. Now, we just had this conversation with uh, Jeremy, a.k.a. Fifi O'Hara, and um, he was ostracized by his family. He spent some time homeless out on the streets. And I asked him, which I, I want to ask you, is where did you kind of get that strength from to, to keep going uh, without that family base? And then on top of that, dealing with your sexuality, I mean, that's a lot to handle. Um, but you still went for a career in entertainment. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, entertainment wasn't always the plan. <laughs> I mean, I guess the entertainment I do now wasn't always the plan. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to be a TV meteorologist. That was what I always wanted to be growing up. So when I ran away from home, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to let them stop me. Like, I was so mad at them. I was like, there's no way they're going to stop me. There's no way, like, this is going to stop me. Um, and I made sure I did it, and I did it. Um, and it was honestly, like, a lot of it was fueled by intense hatred <laughs> so, hey uh, success is the best re revenge yeah. right make your haters your motivators that's what i did <laughs> um now you didn't enjoy your time as a meteorologist on tv at all um why not and and what what's kind of the reality of like the news channel behind the scenes that we never know the, so the reality is why i didn't like it um the reality is is that um you're un you, I mean, everybody wants to work in TV, so yep. they don't pay you a lot to work in TV. Um, and the hours suck. I mean, even, you know, the chief meteorologist in New York City, he's working, I mean, the news is on at 11 p.m. at night. He's working till midnight. Fuck that shit. Like, I don't wanna do that the rest of my life. <laughs> You're like, I'm gonna go do drag in the clubs at two in the no, morning. Yes. <laughs> um, exactly. But it's just, it's, it's a, it's like, it's a career that is odd hours. So if you ever wanted to have a family or if you ever wanted some normalcy in your life, like going out and having fun with friends, like you have to pick a different career. Um, so that part sucked, the pay sucked. Um, and then just the stress, stress of the news business because I mean, the news is on at 11 o'clock, whether or not you have your story or whether or not you're ready. Um, so like you are ready. This is not a drag show where you can push it back, you know? Like it's, it's on. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So, it was just one day I just had enough and I just decided to quit and do something else. Now, how did you get into the uh, adult film industry? Um, so I, when I quit TV, I, I, I just quit. I like had no time. Yeah. <laughs> I like, just, bye, I, bitch. Yeah, I was like, peace <laughs> out, guys, I'm done. Um, <laughs> so I quit, but I didn't have like a job line. Like I didn't have where, what am I going to do for money now? But my friend was a go-go dancer at one of the clubs in El Paso. And I was like, I quit. And they had approached me about working there before, but I worked in TV, so I was like, no. So I was like, hey, do you think they still want me to work there? And he was like, yeah, come in. And so I just started working there that weekend and go-go dancing lived to OnlyFans and OnlyFans lived to porn. And you know, that's just kind of happened. Um, what are the biggest misconceptions you think that people have about somebody that works in the adult film industry? And Anthony, I know you have a lot of uh, opinion on this as, as well. Yes. Oh, the biggest <laughs> misconception might be like that. I don't know. I feel like sometimes, like, I feel like we're over sexualized a lot. Like, mm. I mean, but people only see us when we are having sex. So, like, they think that we're always like that. And I don't know. Like, there's plenty of times where I'm not at all and I'm not in the mood at all. Uh, I just feel like sometimes they think that we're always ready and we always like, want that. Yeah, you're like, I really just want to watch Netflix. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really do want to just chill. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Netflix. That's good. Um, okay, so let's talk about your alter ego, Mascara. Um, how did the idea of doing drag come, come about? I had wanted, so ever since I moved to El Paso, which was really my first big city, that's where I like saw drag a lot. And, um, I really liked it. I thought it was really cool. And then moving to Denver, Denver is even, like Denver drag is very, um, there's a lot of different types. Like El Paso yeah. was maybe pageant, like the Texas, you know, that's yep. what happens. The um, quinceanera type, yep. Yeah, great <laughs> but Denver, it was just so cool. People were doing all these weird things. Um, it was really entertaining. And I always thought it was really cool that I never thought I could do it. And I never wanted to do it because it's, it's, it's even if your drag is cheap, even if I'm just wearing a t-shirt right now, um, <laughs> even if you're just doing that, like it's 
still a lot of money because like all this makeup costs money, the wigs yeah. cost money, the shoes cost money, and it's not things that you wear normally. So it's right. not like, you know, it's not like it's a hobby that's very expensive. Um, so I waited till I was in a good enough place to where I could do it. And then I started doing it, but I had always, ever since I knew about drag, I thought it was really cool. Um, I always appreciated it. I just never knew if I would be able to do it or if it was something that I could do. Uh, now tell me about your first time in public on stage as mascara. How did it go? Uh, it was okay. It was okay. <laughs> I mean, you always... I learned very quickly, like you have in your head what you want to do, and it's not what yeah. you're going to do. So, um, welcome to life. <laughs> yeah, improvise. It wasn't. It wasn't the best, um, but it wasn't. It was fun. I had fun doing it. It was awful, but I had fun doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and hey, it, it only goes uh, goes up up from there. Yeah. Um, now I know you have a boo, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Did you have to tell him, uh, hey, boo, so just so you know, I'm going to start wearing makeup and dresses. Was that a conversation you had to have? It was a conversation we had, and he was very supportive at first, and then he wasn't supportive, and then he was supportive. Now he is. Um, but he was supportive at first because he was like, oh, this is cool. Like, this is fun. Like, yeah, I support it. And then he realized that it's like an expensive hobby. <laughs> yeah. and, and time consuming, too. And, and it's time consuming, too. And like, if I have a show, like I'm going out as mascara and I'm not going out with him. Yeah. Um, so that was the issue. But then now we're fine. Now he likes it and now he's cool with it. Um, and I'm sure that I'm bitch. So <laughs> when I'm in drive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, how have your adult film fans responded to mascara? Um, they've only known about her since July, since uh, that uh, the crossover pageant that I did. I didn't yeah. let them know about her before that, just because they were two separate things and I wanted to keep them separate. Um, and also I wanted to get good enough in drag before I told people about it because I have a large, I have a larger fan base with porn and yep. there's these people that they don't know me. So they're more likely to, they don't like it. They're more likely to be mean about, it. you know what I'm saying? So I really wanted to make sure that I was comfortable enough with myself in drag before I introduced that to them. Now, have there been any issues with your co-stars? Like, oh, he's going to top me. He's a drag queen. No, not at all. Good. They're all. Ever, have I mean, you most... seen Stephen Lee naked? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's they true. Like, like, girl, no, how do you tuck? <laughs> Tucking takes an hour by itself. <laughs> girl, girl, girl. <laughs> Um, now, during Falcon's online Miss Pineapple pageant, we got to see a number of adult uh, film stars in drag. Um, do you think that that's contributing to like what our idea of what a hot man in the adult film industry, it's not all muscle bound tops now as, as the stars. There's more of an acceptance of different types, um, like balancing that feminine masculine, where it's not just <clears throat> kind of characters anymore in porn. We have more storylines that deal with different issues. Do you think that that's, that's changing? I do think it's changing. I think it's a lot of the younger generation that's changing that. Um, the younger people are much more open-minded. And I think that honestly, drag race might be changing that a little bit too, just because like it made drag mainstream and that was something, so it made being feminine more mainstream and more acceptable. So just in that happening, it, it in turn impacts other things. And I think that porn may have been impacted by that as well. Um, but yeah, the younger generation is much more accepting. And it's only, I feel like it's only going to get more accepting in gender. It's going to be less of a thing in the future, um, become less and less of a thing. Now, what do you think is going to happen once we're finally, you know, released out in, into the wild again? Um, when you get asked to make an appearance, it's like, well, you can appear as Stephen Lee or appear as the drag. How are you going to focus your career on, on where you want that kind of appearance booking and and income to come from so i have thought a lot about this i graduate or i should be grad we'll see <laughs> i should be graduating in december um congratulations but, and thank you um and i have i might already have a job lined up um and if i get that job i'm not going to be doing porn i'm not going to say i'm not going to do it anymore but i am going to definitely take a step back and i still might occasionally do it but I'm pretty much done. Um, no, that's yeah. the worst news I've heard today. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but I do plan to keep on doing drag in Denver because it's fun for me. Um, I don't think I'm going to be traveling anymore for go go gigs or anything like that, though. Hmm. Oh, all right. Um, what's it like being a drag queen right now during COVID? Um, I mean, it was boring for a while. Yeah. I used the opportunity to watch a lot of makeup tutorials and get a little bit better. Yeah. Um, but it was, I mean, I don't particularly enjoy, I've done the online shows and I don't enjoy doing them really. Um, it's, it's a lot more work without any of the fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't wanted to do a lot of those. I haven't done a lot of those. Um, but you know, it'll get better. Honestly, the face, I, Denver is doing performances now, drag yeah. shows and stuff and with social distancing, but the performers all have to wear masks. And that honestly doesn't bother me because I'm already uncomfortable as fuck when I'm in drag. So <laughs> you know, well another layer. It. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I know I, I think this last weekend you did uh Frankenfurter from Rock Rocky Horror. Girl, it looked it good. Great. It looked it good. looked amazing. Yeah. It looked real good. <laughs> uh what 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 are some of the biggest mistakes you made uh in your very first days of doing drag that you would tell somebody starting out, don't do that. That's what I did and just don't do it. Um, I should have stayed home. I fairly on after going out or after learning or starting to do my makeup, I went out and I knew I was ugly, but like I was really ugly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I wish I would have. I wish I would have kept those to myself because, <laughs> like you know, everyone saw it and they they were all pretty cool about it. But some people thought I was joking because it was so bad. Um, but yeah. um, so I would have said like just focus on watching videos and learning from that I don't have a drag mother I taught it all myself and you can I mean with YouTube now you can teach yourself um, but I would say that and then also um, I mean just like I said with your performances especially in the beginning it's not going to go how you plan so just be prepared to and ready and know that you're going to have to improvise and go with it uh, what have you learned about yourself the most from doing drag? What have I learned about myself? Um, Talking ain't easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can be a bitch. <laughs> Girl, we knew that before. <laughs> it rolls out so much smoother with lipstick on. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know what? That's actually true. You can be a bitch in yeah. drag, and it's like, oh, that's her character. Go, she's Matt. Yeah. She's yeah. Sassy. Yeah. Anthony, that's yours and mine problem. We just need to do drag, then we can be who we really are. Oh, I'm, I'm, wor I'm in drag from the waist down right now. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm working my way up to the face. I'm doing it opposite. So so, I'm, oh, I'm totally tucked right now. Padded. <laughs> yeah, we got pads on. He has a little oh, quarantine padding. World right now. I'm just kidding. He's like, I've got a he's like, Cleopatra oh. shirt on. <laughs> um, and do you have any quarantine survival tips for us? Yeah, don't move in with your boyfriend right before quarantine. Um. <laughs> That's got to be rough for that because it's not just like the moving in fun. It's like we're stuck together minute after minute after minute. We survived it though, we survived. Um, but I would say try to keep a routine. Yeah, definitely. That's what's helped the most is a routine. Even if it's just like walking the dogs and then like doing a Zoom fitness class or, you know, whatever, just try to do a routine. Um, question, is ordering Postmates three times a day, is that a routine? Cause I'm doing that. <laughs> that is a routine, technically. I don't know if that's a good routine. <laughs> <laughs> routine. Now, I, I, mm, mm. now how are you keeping fit? Because we know uh, you're keeping fit because I see your social media. I am doing Zoom fitness classes. Um, so that's helped a lot. And then the gyms are now open here in Denver. Um, so I'm doing that too. But I, I'm still doing the Zoom classes because I honestly like the Zoom fitness classes. I love it. Okay. Are you uh, ready to play a little rapid fire with us? Let's fly. Okay, let's do it. Uh, strangest comment or request from a fan? I mean, there's always the like the dirty socks. No, that's so weird. Uh, that's gross. Oh well. Oh, it's. You're dry clean dirty tights. Yeah. Mm. Oh yeah. 
Okay. Uh, uh, biggest pet peeve on an adult film set? Um, never happened to me, but I've heard of some people being not very friendly with others. Yeah, I've, I've heard that too. Been, it's never happened I've to seen me. that. <laughs> yeah, because now, uh, Anthony, you've actually worked on, on, on a number of sets. Uh, where does that come from? Is they're just in a bad mood, or they're bitchy, or they're a diva, or what? They're just not nice. Some people are just not nice people. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some people think that we're all there for them. You know, they don't realize. You know, back in, when I was working at the Falcon Days and Naked Sword and Hot House stuff, where it's you know twelve hour shoots and things like that. You know, people are people are allowed to get upset towards the end but some of these people walk in there like rip off a con and like throw it at me or something because you know or you throw it on the ground or you know just just really some of the people just really rude just really really rude um you know so but Yuck. it's all magic at the end of the day <laughs> 10 minutes and it's amazing but there's 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 11 hours 45 minutes sometimes in there you know <laughs> where people are just not nice uh, okay, next rapid fire. What has been your favorite quarantine TV show to binge watch? Um, it would have to be. What was that show? What was the show with? Uh, what was the favorite uh, quarantine TV show? Dateline. <laughs> <laughs> the Witcher. I really like The Witcher. With oh, Henry Cavill. Yeah. What? Oh, no. I, I never got into it. I, no, don't, so I don't like Henry Cavill in it, but I like everything else. No. His voice in it is really annoying. It's like, it's like rah, 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 rah. It's like, right girl, please. Thrones, and I just wasn't yeah. ready for another one. Oh, I liked it. I'll give it okay, all right. Uh, the biggest pet peeve backstage with other drag queens? Um, pet peeve backstage with other drag queens. I'm pretty easygoing. I guess... There's occasionally people that are rude that are drag queens also, the other drag queens. So I guess it would be rudeness also. Um, but I'm usually like, I don't care if somebody borrows something of mine without asking like my hairspray, I don't give a fuck. So I'm like pretty chill. But I know other people- You're so nice. Stuff. Yeah, whatever. Maybe we'll talk to you like in a few years when you've done the circuit and you're like, those bitches, I'm gonna come. I mean, I got a raspy voice. Oh. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's like, bitches uh. last night. <laughs> I could have been a meteorologist too. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, adult. Oh, t tell your boo to cover his ears. Um, an adult film co-star you could go back and film and film and film and film with. Devin Franco. Oh, oh, that was oh, quick. Amazing. Yeah, he is. He's very talented. <laughs> yeah, All right, Stephen Mascara. Tell our uh, tell our audience where you want them to find and follow you. Um, well, my Instagram, my boy Instagram got deleted today, so you can't I saw me. that. Oh, no. What happened? I what happened? Our photo was reported from 2017, and they had it. Oh, my God. That's ridiculous. They were over it. They were like, you're gone. You're really fast. Oh, um, so, Mask for Mascara on Instagram, and then Twitter for my boy one, it's Stephen Lee, the number three, and then X. And it's a fun oh, Twitter. I had to do research. I was very happy doing that I research. I was like... Yeah. <laughs> all right well i wish you uh great luck on your drag career i know we're gonna see big things uh from you because i've already seen big things on you so <laughs> i hope you oh, hasn't heard that a million uh, i had to get that one in there no. ba -ba <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Stephen, and enjoy the rest of your quarantine and say hi to your boo for us thank you i appreciate it Have fun. bye all right, we're going to take another break. When we come back, we have NYC's Kareem Mick Jagger when we come back. And we're back. Okay. <laughs> I want to introduce uh, from New York, from the East Coast, songwriter, promoter, and drag artist Kareem Mick Jagger is celebrating 15 years on the scene in New York City after taking a hiatus from performing to focus on music, digital content, and event production with Honey Davenport of RuPaul's Drag Race. Uh, Mick Jagger is excited to be back in front of the camera and cannot wait to make a safe return to the stage. Please welcome Kareem Mick Jagger. Hello, everybody. Hi, girl. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. You've got the girls out tonight. I can see them from here. Your, your testicles are out. <laughs> a little cleavage for the camera, you know, sex cells. Yes. Oh, it, it sure do. Anthony, let's see some cleavage. Come on. 
I am wearing a Cleopatra shirt. You see that cleavage right in there? <laughs> there Look at you that. Billy <laughs> in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and when I show cleavage, it's it's the cleavage you don't want to see. Um, so, oh. Kareem, <laughs> I have to say, your drag is a mood, girl. How would you? <laughs> it is a mood. That there we go. How how would you describe your drag? Um, I would say um, that I try to bring a unique to perspective to my performance. Um, <clears throat> I often have found myself in situations where I don't fit into what everybody else is doing. And I spent a lot of time and energy um, on trying to fit in. And so now I uh, now I'm now I'm more focused on taking things that people like and flipping them on their head, making it something totally different from what you thought it was going to be. Um, I love that. You know? Yeah. And it, it, it is a surprise, uh, you know, when, when I look at your pictures, when I see your body of work, it's a surprise. Every look that you give is is totally fresh, very different, uh, commenting on society and what we're going through. Now, who are some of your biggest artistic uh, inspirations? That is a good question. Um, I am very much influenced by uh, pop music, uh, very much influenced by R&B music of the 90s, especially uh, girl groups like SWV and In Vogue and TLC. Yes! Um, yeah, uh, I've always been very into R&B and pop music. Um, I grew up on a lot of gospel music as well, so that influences a lot of uh, the music that I write. Um, and just sort of having a collaborative spirit. Um, I believe that, you know, a lot of times there, there, there's no one person that's good at everything. So if I can take my idea and be like, hey, you have this contribution, let's bring that in. Hey, you're good at this. Hey, try your hand at this. And it makes a better project. Like, let's focus on doing that rather than, you know, putting out an inferior project, but it's like, yay, I'm the star and I did everything. Like, I don't see as much value in that as working uh, collaboratively, especially okay, in the so, so, Now, riddle me this, every artist is coming out with new music and Rihanna's coming out with uh, new like house products or housewares or something. <laughs> I just read that today. It's like, girl, make some music. What's wrong with isn't her? not writing for her anymore. <laughs> Look, she wanted to make some money. That's what it is. <laughs> that Rachel Ray money. <laughs> you know, new music trees. is a great music is a great platform. But if you want to make some money, that can be definitely a good idea to pivot into something and diversify that portfolio for sure. Yeah, plus I think she's going to let like all the noise from all of these new releases die down. And the minute we get out of uh, COVID, she's going to be like, this is for you. And we're going to, we're, we're just going to like wet our pants because we're going to be so excited. Um, now, how did you come to New York? Uh, tell me your journey, girl. So I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, and um, both of my parents grew up in New York. So we would uh, come up for the holidays. Um, I'd be shipped up for a month or two in the summer, just so I wouldn't be too country. And, you know, I could spend some time with the extended family and stuff. And so New York has always been something that's been in my orbit, in my awareness. Yeah. Um, I've always seen it as, you know, as somebody that didn't fit in in South Carolina, I was like, okay, this is a place where I could feel more comfortable and, you know, get a foothold into entertainment and live my dreams. Um, <laughs> name, and so, name in life. Exactly, yeah. you know, and so it just always seemed like a, it always seemed like a great fit. So as soon as I graduated, um, well, as soon as I finished college and had one more class, I took it in New York. But um, yeah, I moved here as soon as I, as soon as I was, I was really feasibly able to. And uh, it's been a wild ride ever since, for sure. Now, and Anthony, maybe you can shed some insight on this as well. The New York scene itself uh, is so difficult to break into. And then the LGBT scene, how do you even break into that? Because it's not like, they're like, oh, let's see who new is. It's like, no, it's like, you know, the names that are having the parties are having the parties. They're the popular ones. But I can't imagine how difficult it is to break into the scene. Yeah, go for it, Kareem. <laughs> well, you know, it's... Um... A lot of times it's just about um, building relationships. Um, like I said, um, I'm all about that collaborative spirit. So what I would do is uh, 
I would enter a scene and show how I could be valuable. You know, like what, let's show, let's show these people that are already established and already have their thing, what I could bring to the table because at a certain point doing the same thing over and over again is gonna get stale. Um, the people that are in power and that are doing things are gonna need new ideas. They're gonna need fresh perspectives. So let me show that I'm um, professional, that I'm easy to work with and that I have worthwhile things to contribute uh, to the conversation. And so I think that's really, uh, you know, I sat back and watched nightlife for a while and observed and took notes. And mm -hmm. I was a nightlife writer for a while for Next Magazine before I actually started uh, performing and hosting and promoting and things like that. So I gained a little, sat back and got a little perspective before, before I jumped in head first. Now, Anthony, as a promoter, what, what kind of advice can you give for somebody if you're a performer that's new to the scene? Uh, I'm sure they message you on social media. I'm sure they try to schmooze you up, like, book me, book me. What, what tips would you give? Uh, well, they did. <laughs> Not much anymore. Well, but, yeah. um, for, for a performer, um, you know, it, it, basically, yeah, I mean, Kareem kind of just nailed it with, with added value. You know, what, what do you bring? What can you bring? I, I've never been the type where like, oh, you, you know, oh, no one knows you or you're, you're not this, or, you know, that, that's, you know, especially things like hustle ball and stuff where there's 50 performers, you're not going to get A-list performers. And I don't want to bring all A-list performers. I want to bring right. people that bring something different because the last thing, you know, I, the one pet peeve I, I hate, especially when I'm booking performers for other people or other venues or other events is when that person, especially in like, say the porn world um, and in the drag world to some extent, but in the porn world, you know, when you realize that venue manager or owner or pr 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 uh, promoter or whatnot just wants to book someone they want to have sex with or something, they don't care what the crowd wants. They, they just want this cookie cutter yeah. image of what they think is beautiful. And th that's usually when I take a step back and say, you know, I don't think I'm the person to work with on this one. But, but ultimately, um, people coming to me, I just, you know, just, you gotta, you gotta just, you know, get a thick skin. You got to just keep trying. You got to keep going. But I've always always been the one that if I were to be able to throw a party or something, I'd always be open to bringing in anyone, you know, from all different, you know, popularity and everything, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah. All right. So when we're after this, slide into Anthony's DMs, maybe send a pic oh. or two. <laughs> <laughs> now, Kareem, what would you say your biggest obstacles are uh, besides COVID, don't even count COVID, in being a drag queen in today's uh, age? Um, money is always a factor. Yeah. <laughs> um, as you guys were talking about before, um, drag can be very expensive, yeah. um, especially if you're trying to do it um, to a certain level of production. Um, in, you know, but as you gain more perspective and more uh, experience, you find sort of, you can find ways around it. Um, but sometimes you have to learn some very expensive lessons and pay that as tuition in the school of life. Um, but yeah, money is always, uh, always a consideration when it comes to any kind of production, especially, uh, especially something as involved as drag. Um, also space um, being, in New York. Like, I was going to say, where are you putting your stuff? Exactly. Um, <laughs> people often, you know, will be like, oh, are you going to, are you going to audition for Drag Race? And I was like, I would need an entire separate wardrobe and closet or storage space for yeah. the things that I would wear on Drag Race, because that's different from what I would wear mm -hmm. at, uh, you know, a night when I'm hosting with drunk people at rebar, you know, like yeah. I'm not gonna <laughs> bring my domino couture and, you know, <laughs> Abraham <laughs> Levy into the bar where a bunch of drunks are gonna be spilling stuff on it. Yeah. Like love them for tipping me, but like, that's not the scene. That's not the look. <laughs> some things are photo shoots, some things are TV. And so um, having storage space um, and also just space within venues. Um, I get so jealous of when I see a girl do a cartwheel, like, in a venue. I'm like, if I did that, <laughs> I would knock a not light over. Like I would be off the stage <laughs> by the time I landed. Like these are really long limbs. So I have to really pick and choose like, you know, what movements I do in what spaces because some of the stages, you know, you're performing on a, a postage stamp in uh, some of the venues in New York. So 
uh, yeah, money, money and space are definitely big, big, uh, big factors for drag. Well, and especially I think the trend now, and I think RuPaul's responsible for this, is the trend is, you know, show me your beautiful gown. Whereas, you know, when I grew up on drag, it was like the funny performances, the smart oh. costumes made out of paper mm-hmm. plates that you would get so much joy out of. And now it's just like, look at me be beautiful. It's like, well, that's not what drag is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be entertaining us. And sometimes you don't need a fancy gown for that. Um, right. And some people I think can hide behind that gown. It's like, well, where's your talent? I don't care how beautiful you look. Don't talk about and, Blair Sinclair like that. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, let's get that Blair. Sweet and young and pretty. I definitely think that there is <laughs> there is space for uh, for look queens and beauty queens. Not everybody has to be have the same talent for sure. But yeah. at the same time, um, I remember going to uh, to peppermint shows and Monet exchanges shows and several queens that have been you know on Drag Race who may have gotten red for their fashions, but like they were dominating the scene and we didn't go to their shows to see what they were wearing. Like that was the last thing that was on our minds when we went to like Monet Exchange could be in a head wrap and a t-shirt and Mm -hmm. still pack an audience and turn out a crowd and you'll leave Mm -hmm. there like, I can't wait to see her next show. So it's definitely a different mode of evaluation. Throughout the show. (laughs) Say what? Monet will bring out that sponge halfway through the show and you realize that's why we came and saw her. Oh, she's about to slam Fra- Fra- Frank's red hot sauce, you know, red hot. You know, okay. That's <laughs> oh, my God. Exactly. We all got a little hot sauce. Yeah, uh, amazing. Okay. Amazing. Uh, Kareem, uh, event production for other queens, including one of my personal faves, Honey Davenport. I love these girls, but I know from working with them and Anthony, you know from working with them, Sometimes it can be a little diva-ish, shall we say. What's it like uh, working in that kind of capacity with with some of these RuPaul girls? Um, it can be, it's, it's, it's a very unique challenge. Um, one of the things that I did before I was, uh, well, before Honey and I had worked together for years, but before she was on Drag Race, um, one of the things that I did was um, I promoted and hosted a Saturday night party called GLOW where, um, you know, in addition to a dance party with a DJ and go-go boys that had to be hired and managed, um, I was hiring guest talent and stuff as well. Um, Britta Filter was my co-host for years as well at that party. And um, a lot of times, one of the most difficult things was balancing like managing the staff and making sure that everything happened in a logical manner and being talent at the same time. And so making sure that I looked okay when I went on the yeah. stage and didn't, you know, walk out looking like this with my lashes. <laughs> and, you know. Yeah, be Faye Baker over here. Or like you know, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a go-go boy isn't, isn't uh, doing his job, which happens from time to time, Anthony can definitely attest to that, you know, pulling them in line, making sure they're doing their job, but not in a way that's going to fuck up their mood in the, for the night and like, make them put out bad energy to the audience and um, still be able to walk out and be bubbly on stage and in my interactions on the floor with people and stuff like that. And so um, it just made sense for me to, um, you know, see that situation and be like, okay, I know Honey's going to want to do a bunch of stuff and want to produce events, but she's going to be talent as well. And so one of my most stressful things is balancing that. So if I can take some of that and use my skill as a producer, we can work together to make something a lot better than her trying to do it herself and, you know, look good on stage as well. So um, I took a little bit of a break from performing to focus on that. And it was a really great learning experience because it uh, provided access to a tier of production and entertainment that I had very little um, access to before. Um, So it was an incredible learning experience um, that adds to what I do today. Well, and I think all of us as LGBTQ content creators, we've had to learn a lot. Like I had to learn uh, how to use Zoom. I had to learn how to set up the computer, whatever. And I'm not tech savvy. But we've had to learn these skills just to survive and to keep our brand alive. So I think it is so important to understand every aspect of the business that you're in. Okay, I want to know one of the craziest onstage stories that you have, whether you were part of the show, or whether you were on stage, backstage. What, what's a story that sticks out to you? Um, 
Okay, so I'll tell this one. Um, there was one Saturday night where um, we were, um, I had hired a particular go-go boy, Jared Bradford. Um, shout out to Jared, haven't talked hey, to Jared. him in a while, but yeah, you know, like a very shrewd, shrewd business person, very good looking guy, really knew his stuff. So I hired him one night to be um, a go-go boy at Glow. And um, we had a couple of miscommunications, I think, as far as just sort of the expectations of the night. Um, and, you know, at halfway through the night, I sent him home. I said, hey, here's your pay. Like, I'm not going to send you home without pay. But as far as the many things that I'm juggling right now, like our dynamic just isn't working. Like, it'll be better for the night if you're not here. Um, I feel like, you know, you're not really hearing me and there's a certain way that this night goes and I just needed to run a certain way for it to be successful. And he at one point said, I also feel like you're not really listening to me. And so when I stepped back, when it wasn't the heat of the moment with, you know, worrying about the show going on and worrying yeah. about do these three drag queens have their music together for their numbers and are the go-go boys in place and is everybody happy and has a drink in their hand or the sales good? When I had a chance to step back from that situation, I was like, okay, yeah, I could see how I might not have been listening to him at that time. And I could see how there might have been some doubt or discrepancy as to how it wasn't clear exactly what was expected on both sides of us. And so I changed my approach as far as, you know, the communication that I had with my talent when I was hiring them and really made sure to lay out specifically, okay, here's what you can expect from me. Here's what I expect from you. Do we have confirmation that we're on the same page as that? Okay, awesome. Let's move on from there. Um, and so it really made me um, reevaluate how I was uh, how I was preparing the talent that I was hiring before I even had them, um, you know, in the schedule. Okay, let's talk dating and drag. <laughs> um, okay, does, all right. Does does drag ever get in the way of dating? You know, you're trying to have somebody over and there's a high heel shoe on your pillow or there's <laughs> lipstick on the counter. Does it I ever get in the way? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I do my best to keep my drag mess contained. Um, so that isn't as much of a problem. It's definitely a drag mess, but usually it's contained in a certain <laughs> area so that it doesn't quite spill over into other areas of my life. <laughs> um, at the moment, I am taken. Um, oh, actually, oh. for a good long moment, I have been. But um, oh, yeah, spill yeah. the tea, girl. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't want to put my man on blast. But he, is, okay. he is watching. Okay. Hello, Mwah. but um, <laughs> yes. So that's not not as much of a uh, uh, a factor for me. But um, I would say that you know, because of perceptions of masculinity and, you know, insecurities that other people have and stuff like that. Um, it definitely is harder to, uh, to date, to cruise, to hook up yeah. as a drag queen. Um, but at the same time, like I have periods where I get hit on in drag more than I do when I'm out of drag which is always an interesting experience because I'm like, are you sure you know what's under here? Cause <laughs> I'm wearing a lot of makeup right now. Like this is not my natural brow line or my actual makeup. So. Like, I love you, honey, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> like go to town, these come off. <laughs> but it is funny cause I know uh, that there is a market especially like super butch masculine men that love their drag queen sex like they want their... oh yeah and they always want to be taught by drag queens like it's, it's yes. actually really funny which i'm like yeah. okay yeah bring on the football coaches not mad at it <laughs> <laughs> have you ever ho hooked up in drag yes yeah 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 i definitely have um mm -hmm. there was one night when i was i used to make videos outside of the american apparel in hoboken where i live because they had like, you know, bright lighting. I didn't get that it was not the right lighting for my skin tone at the time. We're all on a journey. But I would stop there, <laughs> I would stop there after, you know, every gig on my way home and make, you know, just some content for Instagram. And um, this guy walked by and like said something. I forget what he said, but I was like, give me like two minutes to wrap up this, uh, this, 
this this video I'm making and we'll talk. And uh, that ended up being a uh, a regular situation for a little while, which was fun. Oh. Uh, yeah, oh, wow. you know. But uh, and eventually he was like, "Yeah, don't even worry about putting on anything. Just bam." Because I would always see him after I had a gig, like yeah, on the yeah, way yeah. home, and I was like, "Ooh, I can walk home from this place with my pads in my hand because I had already taken everything off. I wasn't putting it back on. Like, fuck <laughs> that." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we 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 we've had some moments. I prefer not to because again, drag is expensive, and I'm not yeah. trying to get lube on any of the stuff that I had custom made <laughs> or that I ordered from Amazon that I told you was custom made but um, <laughs> you know you gotta wait for prime and stuff <laughs> okay uh, are you ready to play a little rapid fire with us you know what let's do it okay let's do it uh least favorite part of doing drag least favorite part yeah, least favorite part of doing drag is uh, taking it off. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Also my favorite sometimes, but sometimes you just look so good. You don't want to give up the fantasy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're like going to Starbucks at six in the morning looking looking like a queen, girl. <laughs> I, <have. laughs> I You know, I think that that would be my least favorite because I just want to throw things everywhere. And I know you have to keep your eyelashes like clean and you have to put the wigs back right. You got to put the jewelry back. I mean, I can barely find my wallet the morning after, much less my heels. Um, the shadiest thing you've seen backstage at a drag show? The shadiest thing I've seen backstage at a drag show. There was um, one drag show at um, Boots and Saddle that I was in where um, this guy came in and he was uh, handing out $20 bills with shots. He was like, I'll give you $20, but you have to take the shot. That was cool for the first five or six shots. Um, then after that, things started to get a little messy. And so um, one, of the queens, uh, one of the queens that I was working with was uh, saying a lot of stuff under her breath. And so the other queen that I was working with came backstage and it may or may not have turned into a physical altercation. Um, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was quite a night. So uh, queens out there, Make sure you regulate your drinking while you're while you're performing. <laughs> Got up to 160 bucks that night. Yeah. <laughs> look, look, is it worth it though? Is it worth it to catch a possible charge? Oh, oh Lord. Okay, most overperformed drag song in your opinion. Oh. There are so, so many. many. I mean, there's Burning Up by Jesse J. Um, there's the monologue from, um, I believe it's Designing Women. That's the night. Yes. Oh, God. No, yes, that one. Because like, it's Georgia. like a, yeah, it's like a five minute one, too. It's like, girl, we know where this is going. One. I didn't even see the show. <laughs> yeah. Girl, you are I mean, that show. I usually say um, it was already, it was already played out when Monet Exchange did it, but Monet Exchange did it in uh, Miss Hell's Kitchen a few years ago and won because she did it so well. So I usually mm. tell Queens, if you're gonna use it, make yep. sure you do it better. Spot Watch on. Monet's, ex Monet's Exchange's performance. And if you can do it better than that, then you can do it. Otherwise, find something else. There's plenty of media that you can use that hasn't been driven into the ground by other Queens. Yeah, well, it's, it's like uh, Angina this last season doing Eartha Kit. No, no, oh, yeah. not, not Angina, it was not, uh, not Juju. Juju. Isn't yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh God, another Eartha kit. And then she nailed it to such a point that nobody can do it anymore. Um, what challenge would you add to RuPaul's Drag Race? What challenge would I add to RuPaul's Drag Race? I mean, I would love um, a challenge where you had to make a multimedia mix, where you uh, had songs and stand-up comedy and movie oh. clips that, uh, that you had to weave together to tell a story. Um, that's a that. very specific skill. It also would cost a lot of money in licensing, so it might not be actually practical for production. But it's something that um, a lot of New York queens do that is very relevant to, you know, yeah. just the reality of what the gigs are that we have um, that would, I think, possibly be very entertaining for audiences. Um, but, you know, you'd have to pay a lot in licensing fees to make it happen. But it's on VH1 now. Don't they have millions of viewers? <laughs> 
<laughs> Girl, have you heard the songs that they still have for their oh lip God. sync contest? It's like, here's a new song by Captain and Tennille. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Kareem, uh, worst date ever that you've had? Worst date? Um, you know, I can't recall specifically my worst date, but there was a point when uh, my boyfriend and I first started dating and um, he mentioned, he mentioned, he mentioned that we were on a date he said, I forget what exactly he said, but I was like, I started laughing and I was like, oh, so this is a date, huh? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It was definitely an awkward oh. date moment. Yeah. Oh. And now you're in love. still together. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm jealous. Okay. <laughs> Kareem, tell, tell our audience uh, where you want them to find you and follow you. Well, as you can see right here in this beautiful Chiron that they've made for me, uh, you can find me at Kareem McJagger on all platforms, K-A-R-E-E-M-M-C-J-A-G-G-E-R -E 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 on YouTube, on Facebook, on IG, on Twitter. Um, I have different content that I put on those different platforms yeah. because of the rules and stuff yeah. like that. I am also on drag for fans. Yes! At yes, so fan. I have a lot of exclusive content that I don't put anywhere else. So um, you can subscribe to me there. I also have free content that I put on um, if you do not want to subscribe. Um, so a lot of the, uh, the content that I've been making in uh, while we've been locked down, I've been putting up there um, and have a lot of footage that um, I have not worked through yet that I will be uh, we'll be releasing there as well. That'll be exclusive. So yeah, that's where to find me. She's also on Venmo at the same name too and Cash App and PayPal. So <laughs> yes, yeah, work it girl. A few steps. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Boom. Well, thank you so much. Um, I know it's late there to NYC. So have a good night's sleep. And um, I love keeping track of you on social media. You're such an artist um, in and out of drag. Um, it's such a treat to follow you. Oh yeah, and thank you for having me and sharing your platform with me. This has been a really cool show and um, I'm really happy to share it, uh, shared the screen with uh, this complete lineup. Like, I'm very honored, so thank you. Well, we, we got to celebrate all kinds of drag um, tonight, so that's always a good thing. Um, thank you so much, Kareem. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Kareem. <laughs> wow, good to see you, Anthony. Good to see you. All right, Anthony, we are at the end of our evening. Um, I wonder how long you're going to be marooned in Florida for. <laughs> oh, I have my, well, I mean, I have another flight. So my other flight is on Thursday. So we'll see. I'm running out of uh, theme parks and money. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you have done a lot of, like, you've been to a wedding in Oklahoma. You've been traveling to different friend groups, safely, of course. Well, yeah, um, and I got to go back and, and quarantine all over again, which I'm, I'm okay with at this point. But it's probably, I think, my third time quarantining in New York. So I got to go back and take another two weeks and sit in my apartment. Oh, my God. What are you going to do besides drink? <laughs> Drugs. <laughs> <laughs> the huge. The huge. <laughs> no, no, I'll just be drinking. I'll be drinking. I'll be working. Um, we do have a lot of Drag for Fans stuff coming up and, and Just for Fans and um, just a lot of really exciting things happening there. So I'm, I'm holding my tongue on what exactly that is quite yet because it's a good rollout. And as soon as that happens, you will be the first to know. I think you're gonna be very excited about it. But, um, but yeah. Fabulous. Again. <laughs> now, what, what would your idea for the first party that you can throw when we're all out of this? What kind of party it, is it gonna be? And am I invited? Uh, you're always invited. Just the front door, the front door guy doesn't know that, but I know that. Yeah. No, <laughs> he's like the help know. comes I mean, in the back. <laughs> you know, I had so many parties planned this year. I'm just at the point where I'm just like, ugh, do I even want to try to do it again? I don't know. It, it's, it's 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 like everything got shut down. So, um, I mean, I don't know. I just want to have a fun, just a fun party, and I would love to just do something that's outside of my usual parties that I throw and something that just brings up everyone of every shape, size, color, background, age together, because we need to dance. <laughs> yes, we need to dance, we need to day drink, we need to flirt. Oh God, girl, I'm going, I'm going through a dry spell. <laughs> Are you? Are you? You look good. 
<laughs> dry spell. Go, 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 go. You're drowning, girl. You're not dry. You're drowning. <laughs> All right. Tell our audience where you want them to find and follow you. Uh, you can follow me on um, Facebook at Mr. Anthony John. Um, or you could also follow me on Instagram, Mr. Anthony John, Mr. Anthony John. All right. And you have also been uh, quarantining with your boo as well. Yes. And any Same. tips? I get so many requests. It's like, ask him how to survive quarantine with a boo. Uh, you know, I don't know. You just like, I think, I, who said it earlier about the fighting? I, Stephen Lee said it. It's like, you know, you're going to fight. You're going to argue. You're going to bump heads. But at the end of the day, you're just going to have to apologize and get over it. It's, it's everything is, everything is good. Um, you're all in it together. Um, you know, I'm lucky we have this cute little dog that kind of keeps us sane, I think. So cute. Um, it's, yeah. you know, I don't know. You just find, you find things. You have to find ways. You know, New York City, you know, the dining is now outdoors. You just have to do it and get, get used to the smells while you're trying to eat. <laughs> you, know, <it's> like, <laughs> you know, it's just, you got to, you know, travel if you can. Flights are so cheap right now, even if you have to go home and quarantine. You know, we're, we walked around Disney, Disney World for the last few days and, you know, Although it's, you know, the world's coming to an end, there ain't a line at Splash Mountain. <laughs> you, you mean Princess it. and the Frog? Yeah, I mean Princess and the Frog. It's still Splash Mountain, but but yeah. So, I mean, you just got to take the good, the bad, the ugly. You got to realize we're all in it together and we'll get through it. And it's going to be fine. We're going to look back at it. Like like we look back at the, the pandemic of, of 1918 where everyone's yeah. there their masks on it's the yep. same damn thing it's just it's in color we, and we're not wearing fancy hats <laughs> we well some of us are wearing hats that we shouldn't be wearing but anyway oh well. <laughs> oh rah. all right it's always a treat to chat with you that's an okay hat it's not red <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody all right. that's been another episode of on the rocks uh it's it's a grab bag of fun every week here. We never know who's going to show up. Give us a like, a subscribe, a share, send nudes. Head to ontherocksradioshow.com for all of this fun for free. And hopefully we'll be back in our newly remodeled studio because it looks fabulous. Uh, stay happy, stay healthy, stay tipsy, and sign up uh, as a content creator or as an audience member on dragfor.fans. It's free to sign up. And until next week, we'll see you next Tuesday. This has been another episode of On The Rocks. Tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air. Find everything On The Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week, stay fabulous.